Lutheran Church of the Ascension's One Tree, Many Branches concert series, Impromptu. We call it impromptu because that is the word that means in music improvisation. And we've had to do a lot of improvising these days with what the pandemic has put upon us all. And musicians have had to do more improvising than just about any other, uh, any other area that I know because what is music unless it's live? But we found ways to do that now, and we're so excited to be able to share that with you. Um, <clears throat> and I think one of the other things the pandemic has taught us is that we need the arts. We need music. We need this as an essential part of our living. Um, without this, we lose our sense of connection to one another, our sense of, of humanity. And so I'm, I'm so excited that we've started up despite all odds, and I'm so excited that we are here with the Blue Violet Duo. Um, this is a group that I've been wanting to invite for quite some time now, and um, we, we were finally able to make this work. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about Blue Violet. They first uh, came together uh, as students. Uh, they both attended the Eastman School of Music, and I'm not sure if they met there or at Northwestern, but uh, they came together as a group there and have been playing together ever since. Um, they won a competition that led to their Carnegie Vial Hall premiere at, in New York City in 2014, and have since gone on to play at many of the venues that I'm sure we're familiar here with in Chicago, namely the Chicago Cultural Center, the Dame Myra Hess series. Um, and they both do some really fascinating things uh, outside of their work together. Um, I know Louise does a lot of uh, chamber music and orchestral uh, piano playing and does a lot of speaking on that. And Kate also does a lot of playing in orchestra and speaking and teaching. And so they're, they're here today. Why should I be telling you all about them when they can talk a little bit about themselves? So at this time, I would like to hand it over to uh, Kate and Louise, uh, the Blue Violet Duo. Thank you so much, Misha. And can, can everyone hear me all right? With the, with the mask, okay, just you know, let me know if, if I need to turn it up. Well, we are just so excited to be here today. Thank you all for joining us. We, this is so special for us to come together and, and you know, to, to finally get to play you know, for you all and, and just to enjoy our time together. You know, I, we've really been missing that um, so much. So thank you, thanks for joining us. Um, so I, I'm Kate Carter and Louise Chan is over here behind me <laughs> and, and you know when Misha asked us to play the timing was really interesting because we um our duo had just come off of recording our second album at the end of August and so two of the pieces that you'll hear today are from that album and then you'll also get to hear one one piece that we're going to do live that, at the end so I'm going to turn it over to Louise to introduce the first piece. All right, so one of our missions as a duo is to perform pieces, um, or to find pieces that are lesser known and less performed by American composers that we feel are valuable and are accessible and deserve more recognition. Um, so this first piece we're playing today is the Sonata for Violin and Piano by Irene Britton Smith. And we came across this sonata during a trip to the Center of Black Music Research a few years ago. Um, this is located at Columbia College in downtown Chicago. And the lady who was working there, um, she, had, she had a few things in mind for violin piano already. And uh, we were attracted to this work, uh, partly because Irene Brinsmith was a Chicago native. So she was born in 1907 and she ended up being a primary grade teacher at Chicago Public School. Um, but one of her dreams was to be a composer and she was also an accomplished pianist. Um, so during uh, sabbaticals, during summers, she studied, um, she took additional studies at Juilliard, Eastman, Tanglewood, Fontainebleau in, um, in France with Nadia Blomanger, so she has some very, very big names in her resume. Um, she completed a master's degree from DePaul University here in Chicago, and she has a very large output that includes works for violin, piano, orchestra, voice, and chorus. And uh, 
Many of those are arrangements of spirituals. And so her style, which reflects a lot of her European training, is uh, very romantic, neoclassical. And uh, this sonata that we'll perform for you today uh, uses classical forms. Uh, we'll be presenting the first movement only. Um, it's a sonata of three movements. And so this first movement has a lyrical opening theme that's coupled with a more sprightly and playful second th theme. And we hope you'll enjoy this.
Okay, there we are. Can you all hear me? Good. <laughs> Sorry. This it's a learning curve like everything else, but there, you know, we're we're getting there. Um, thank you so much for that, uh, Louise and Kate. That was a yeah, gorgeous piece that, of course, I didn't know before. Um, and that's your whole point uh, is to be able Hi. to introduce these these works that we, we aren't familiar with. And another thing I find fascinating about this project is that, you know, it seems obvious. You know, let's focus on American composers. We're in America, but the the classical music uh, canon has not often included a lot of American composers. I mean, we know our Dvorak and, you know, sure, we know our Gershwin, but there are a lot of American composers out of there, you know, out there. And, you know, the European canon has tended to dominate the musical scene. And so this, it, although it may seem obvious, it's not so obvious. And the other thing that I love about this is the diversity in this country uh, is really truly represented in American music. You can't say American music sounds like this or like that, you know, just in, in the same way that you can't say European music sounds Italian or it sounds French. I mean, there are all of these, you know, different influences, but we have such a disparate uh, set of influences. And so I'm, I'm curious uh, as to where you're going from here with, with this idea. Any new projects yeah. on the on the, the bench? Sure. Well, um, I can start off by talking about the some of the pieces on the rest of our album, which we just recorded. And I wanted to say a shout out to our producer, Pete LaBella, who is here. Thanks. Thanks for joining us, Pete. So, um, yes, as Louise mentioned, part of a, a large part of our mission as a duo is to try to, um, you know, find and perform works that are perhaps not as well known, but that, you know, des deserve to be, that are enjoyable and accessible um, and just, you know, not as well known in the repertoire. And so I think you, you put it perfectly, um, the points that you make about some of the American repertoire. And so in particular, um, a lot of the music that we choose happens to have some, some other musical influence, such as jazz or pop music or even Americana, such as hoedown and blues. And so a lot of the pieces on both our debut album, American Souvenirs, and then this, out, this upcoming album have that. So one of them, um, the Morton Gold, a suite for violin and piano, it's kind of like a tour of American music. It has um, a hoedown, a blues, uh, a march, you know, all very American themes, and it's just very accessible. Mm -hmm. And then um, the Gwyneth Walker, which you'll hear today. So I'll save that one for, you know, right before we hear that piece. But Louise, did you want to speak about some of the other pieces on, on our new album? Um, oh, yes, there's something fascinating about our album, which is that two of the works have uh, percussion in them. And one of them is a sonata by George Antile. He was an American composer who lived in Paris for some time. Um, he was active um, around World War I, 1920s, and so on. Um, he did some film music as well. And his second sonata, which is on our album, is just a bombastic mishmash of themes that are reminiscent of 1920s dance styles. Um, it has really comical tempo markings. There's a piano cadenza that sounds like a self-destructing machine. And then there is a section that comes out of nowhere, which has an Arabian theme in the violin that says it's accompanied by tenor and, uh, wait, what is it? Tenor and bass drums. So I'm the one playing those drums in the album. Um, and then the other piece that has percussion actually has drum set in it. And I'll let, I'll let Kate talk about that. Yeah, so that piece that Louise mentioned with the drum set um, is called Celeste by Stuart Copeland. And some of you, can I see a show of hands? Who recognizes that name? Maybe from an outside the classical world. So he is, of course, the former drummer from the band The Police. And so you might ask how we came across this piece. Well, I happened to be playing in the premiere of his opera called The Invention of Morel, which was done in Chicago here at the Studebaker Theater a couple of years ago. And so when I played um, that piece, I, I really enjoyed his music. And so I said, well, let's see wh what else did he write? And so we found th this the score to Celeste, um, but it just, all it said was violin and piano. There was no mention of any other 
instrument. It, either there was no part, there was nothing in the title. And so we did a little search, you know, got onto YouTube to hear, find some recordings. And lo and behold, there was a live performance with the composer at the drum set. So there is still no um, written out part. So our, you know, very talented colleague who also was a uh, fellow Eastman Knight, fellow student with us, Brady Miller, he um, was brilliant on the drum set and he just improvised the part. So mm. you can, will hear that on our upcoming album. Wow, exciting. Yeah, and, and for those of you uh, who are familiar with the chat function on Zoom, if you open the chat function, you'll see that uh, Kate has put, uh, both Louise and Kate have put uh, a link to their website where you can uh, find, uh, you know, download instructions for, for this album or ordering instructions. I don't know how it works anymore. Do you yeah, all like, put them in an um... envelope and... and... <laughs> We, we can't, there, there is a physical CD where you oh, have the liner good. notes and all the wonderful information and you know, the physical CD. And then there is, um, there's also the streaming on the, all the usual platforms, Spotify, Apple Music, um, et, et cetera. Very good, very good. All right, well, listen, folks, we're gonna, I, I think I'm gonna let, uh, Kate, are you gonna introduce the next piece? Yes, I'd like okay. to talk about the Walker. Um, so what I, one of the things, though, let me before you do, um, I wanted to, you know, let you know that we are going to have a chance to talk with the artists and, you know, talk amongst one another because, you know, after all, this is not your your everyday concert, and you know, one of the great advantages of this is we can really talk face to face, um, and and you know, ask those questions that have always been burning on our minds. And so, you know, while you're listening to this music, if you have anything, you know, even if you think it's a silly question, it, no question is too silly because you know we we love to answer questions. We love to find out what's on people's minds when they're listening to this music and and what they wonder about what's happening behind the music. You know, like does you know does Kate like surf or anything, or does you know does Louise like to skydive? Yeah, you know, I was going to ask that one later, but you can take that question if you want to. Um, but just be just be thinking about this because this is you know it's a great opportunity for us to be able to find out what's in the life of a, a musician, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about pandemic life later. Um, you know what that's been like for for a musician. So so anyway, go ahead, Kate. I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, the next piece that you will hear um, in the recording. It are called the Fantasy Etudes by Gwyneth Walker. And Gwyneth Walker is a living composer based in Vermont. She attended Brown University and the Hart School of Music. And her catalog includes over 300 commissioned works for orchestra, chamber ensembles, chorus, and solo voice. Um, and so these, these pieces you're about to hear, they were composed in 1992 by Marjorie Connor, who is a pianist, and her 13-year-old daughter, Pamela Connor, the, the violinist. And the intent was to provide a suite of short pieces which could be enjoyed by performers of all ages. So this is a really enjoyable short suite. There are five short movements in all, and I'll read you the movement titles. The first is called Countdown, then Lyric, Rough Rhythms, Romance, and finally, Strolling on Frederick Street, which, as the title suggests, is reminiscent of a jaunty walking music written while the composer was living on Frederick Street in San Francisco. And just an interesting feature to note about this piece is the composer's use of improvisation in a couple of the movements. So for example, in the second movement, the lyric, um, the violinist is instructed to enter at any time. It, this is in the last section of the piece that you'll hear this. So, um, you know, it's, it gives a kind of a dreamlike quality against the backdrop of the, the repeated figure in the piano. Mm. And to me, it almost sounds like being underwater. Mm. And the other place, the other movement that has an improv component is in the last movement. And Louise, do you want to talk about that? Um, sure. I mean, it just comes during one of those uh, uh, swing rhythm patterns. Maybe I can play. <laughs> It, it's like uh, maybe you're going down a very steep street in San Francisco or something like that. So it just yeah, says to play random pitches. It's really, and what does it look like? How's it notated in the score? Um, there are two instances. One, she actually writes out notes and then she says next to it, or random pitches. 
And the other one, she just writes, uh, I can't remember, it's, I think it's just stems. Like X, X's, yeah. I think she writes stems and then says play random pitches. So they're, they're <laughs> pretty short, but see if you can notice those. Yeah, so I think we're ready to listen to the fantasy etudes. Okay.
Thank you again. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, Bill, what? Oh, you're still sharing the screen, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, tell us a little bit about what life has been like since March for you all. Well, Louise, do you wanna start? Um, sure. When this started, I actually just came off one of the busiest seasons I had had of playing. Um, just the week before the shutdown, I had a performance on WFMT, so I was working really hard for that, and I was about to take a short break from practicing, and then, and then this happened. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I stopped practicing for longer than I should. <laughs> <laughs> What I was doing is I, I started sewing. I was making masks for a, uh, a mask drive. Um, mm. th this, this, is, this I made myself. Mm. Um, and uh, what else was I doing? I was folding origami. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and by the way, when you, when you uh, do go to the, the link of, of Blue Violet, you will, you know, there's a little thing where you can check to see about each one of them. And then you can go to Louise's page and you can see she not only does origami, but I've seen some still motion film that you've, you know, choreographed with some, some of the piano music that you do. Yeah. Um, so you can, you can look me up. Uh, my, my name is Musical Origami on YouTube and on Instagram. <laughs> Um, one other thing I did was I was experimenting with the app Acapella, which many of you may have heard of. It's a layering app where you can record one part and add instruments or add yourself playing other instruments. So I, I learned some piano for eight hands and I played all four parts myself <laughs> to see how that would work. Um, and then later in the summer, we, we, um, we scheduled our album recording and I've been playing regularly since then. <laughs> Terrific. How about you, Kate? Yeah. Well, um, you know, at first I was kind of relishing this rare opportunity to just practice for pleasure, mm -hmm. not for a deadline or, you know, getting something ready for a specific right. date. Um, so just getting to practice maybe solo, like solo Bach that I don't always have the, the chance to do. Um, but really, really, really missed this you know yeah having that connection and interaction with audience and feeling the energy and like the just like the synergy so it was a very strange i mean let me back up for a sec so i, I did have a couple of collaborations so in in june i did um a, just an in-home concert similar to this with my husband rodolfo who's also a violinist and then when things started opening up a little bit more june or maybe it was even july um, I got together with some dear colleagues and friends of mine, and we played some chamber music in a colleague's backyard. So we were making music that way. Um, but it felt so strange to be, you know, we had um, uh, to be recording this album. You know, we, we had planned it, of course, for, bef before all of the uh, quarantine started. And so we asked ourselves, you know, can we still go through with this? And it, it was unclear if it would be possible, but ultimately we decided to go ahead with it. But it, it was so strange because the last concert Louise and I had played together had been January. Oh, wow. So we had not rehearsed or performed for like, <laughs> what, six or seven months? Yeah, it was very strange. And so, I mean, in a way, however, the, you know, as, as funny as that felt, uh, because the, the previous album we'd been playing, of course, like, you know, up, up to the week before and playing right. in public, et cetera. But, but I, it, in a way, I think it helped to perhaps like deepen our understanding of the pieces mm. to have that that time and the, the solitude Apart. and then yeah yeah and also to when we did come back we had a really fresh perspective yeah so, so i think that was a silver lining well and that's that's one of the things about what we do as musicians i mean there's so much like hammering you know in the details of what we're doing and it takes repetition upon repetition and after a while you know it's great because you know you have this solidity and this this confidence but sometimes that spark of inspiration that impromptu spirit as you will you know tends to you know you have to work harder to get it get it again and you know sometimes the freshness mm -hmm. of of just being able to approach this situation uh new with fresh ears with without all of the extra rehearsal time you know can really change your performance yeah. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one one other thing that I, I I need to mention before we we go on, and we're gonna we're gonna do a live performance now. So, the you know maybe you thought that last one was live, and if you did, great, we tricked you. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, no, those were those were pre-recorded, pre and part of the reason we're doing pre-recorded is we're experimenting a little bit with to see. What is the quality? How is the quality coming across? Because pre-recorded is a little bit more reliable, whereas you know doing it this way is a little less reliable. But I think we got a pretty good sound before we opened up the doors, the doors. Um, and um, I'm interested to hear your reactions to, you know, was it better live or recorded? So that's that's one thing that I, I want to know. And maybe something lingering in your mind or you know that you can comment on about after after we hear this last live performance. The other thing I need to bring up is of course that One Tree Many Branches is very much dependent on generous uh, patrons like yourself for support. And um, in this time especially when musicians are being furloughed left and right. I think you've been reading in the papers, you know, Chicago Symphony is off for another year, the Lyric Opera, the New York Phil. All of these institutions are closing down because they have to, and we can no longer be in person. And, you know, what has been so heartwarming about all of this is that the musicians, some of these, you know, incredibly fine musicians have been finding ways to use their music, to utilize their music, to make all of us feel a little bit more connected to make all of us feel a little bit you know richer but a lot of this has been done uh just from the sweat of their brow and they are not being remunerated for this during this time now not to say that you know there isn't still an economy around music there is but uh it's taken a hit and you know at this time more than ever we really need uh strong support for uh what we do as artists to keep this lifeline going as we continue to quarantine, as we continue to feed uh, off of this, this richness that, that comes over the interwebs for us. Um, so I, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna do this the way we usually do. Obviously, you know, you will not find a plate coming through your window for you to deposit a check. <laughs> but, um, I, I believe our, our master of ceremonies, well, no, actually that's me, isn't it? Our, our committee chair, uh, Bill Schneider, will be sending you a, um, in, uh, an email tomorrow as a follow-up, and he will give you all sorts of information as to how you can continue to support the series. But, you know, if, if you cannot at this time, that we understand, but if you can, we strongly encourage you to do so because we are, we are very much, you know, thinking not just about this series, but about the musicians who, you know, who are working and a lot of times giving of themselves, but not receiving what they need to be receiving too. So please consider uh, a gift to the series at this time so that we can continue to do this. And who knows, you know, it's impromptu, you know, we could have six concerts, maybe we'll have 26 concerts. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see as we go along. Um, and, and I'll bring your attention to the next uh, event on our series, which will be Kevin Kosnick, and he's going to give us a tour of his percussion studio. So you, not only are you going to get to see drums on a stage, but you'll get to walk around his basement and see where he keeps everything and how he keeps everything and you know, all the various gadgets he has that he doesn't necessarily always get to this stage. So that's going to that's gonna be a fun little tour. Um, but let's get back to the program at hand. So, uh, Kate, would you like to introduce uh, the last piece on the program? Certainly, certainly, yeah. And actually, I think Luis um, would like to talk about this next piece. Sure. Uh, we're playing some selections from Amy Beach's pieces for piano and violin, Opus 40. Uh, she may be a familiar name to some of you. Uh, she was the first American female composer to compose and publish a symphony. So she was a successful composer of large-scale works. Um, her Gaelic symphony was premiered by the Boston Symphony in 1896. Um, and her, she, her style is very romantic, as you'll hear from what, uh, from what you'll what we'll play. Um, I should mention she is uh, from New England, born in New Hampshire. And she married a surgeon at the age of 18 who severely restricted her performing activities, uh, which was typical for middle-class families of that day, unfortunately. But 
fortunately, she turned her attention to composition, and she was very prolific. She was mostly self-taught, um, and she has a vast output of large-scale symphonic works, choral works, as well as chamber music, many songs, and solo piano works, and some works for piano and violin. Uh, her best-known piece is probably the Romance, um, and we also unearthed these three pieces that she wrote. Um, the first is called La Captive, the second is Verses, and the third is a Mazurka. And we will be playing the second and third movements for you right now.
That was, okay. are, we, are we back? I think we're back. Yes, just getting one. Started. I don't want to get all dizzy here. <laughs> so we haven't worked out quite all the bugs yet, but thank you so yes. much, Kate. Um, that was absolutely yeah. gorgeous. And I, I think if I were to vote, I would vote for live any day. <laughs> I see. Oh, really? I, I see some some big um, thumbs up over there. Yeah. No, it's you know you. I think I think we've been you know we've all been kind of craving uh, this and uh, I'm sorry I'm not hearing myself and so I'm wondering whether anybody else can is everybody else I can hear you. Oh, good. Yes, I see. Live is the best in the chat. Yes, <laughs> A plus. All right, Thank fantastic. You. Yes. Um, and I'm seeing some, brow you know, this is, the, this is the weird part about Zoom concerts is, you know, we're all clapping in our hearts. <laughs> but, but hopefully you can hear all, all of our hearts fluttering. <laughs> it's like I'm smiling. I'm smiling behind the mask really big. <laughs> live is so much more rich and warm and engaging. I vote for live too. Oh, look at this. Yeah, this is great. This is great. Well, I, I can't tell you, you know, how much we appreciate you being here to share this with us. And this time, please, you know, please, folks, don't leave unless you have to or unless you're just terribly bored or you don't want to look at me anymore. Um, <laughs> there, there's, there's two lovely ladies that you can look at, so you don't have to look at my screen. Um, but, I, you know, stick around and, and you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to just, you know, have an opportunity to talk. Um, you know, I was looking for the hand raising option here in the chat and I can't find uh -huh. it. Um, so if you go, I believe if you go under participants. Yeah, it should be there. I and mean, then that's where I've always yeah, found and then, it. And then, um, yeah. Where well, is that? yeah, I don't know. There's there's something wrong with it. But if, if you would like to, you know, unmute yourself, why don't you just put something like if you have a question, why don't you say, you know, question in the chat bar, and you know we're happy to you know unmute your uh, your mic, or you can unmute your mic and you can ask the question, or you could even put your question in the chat. Um, Bill, why don't you watch the chat while I you know because I um, <clears throat> I actually I see a hand up. Oh, you do a galaxy a galaxy tab. I'm not sure. Oh, that is okay. So are they able? To, oh, here, ask to unmute. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. I, I keep hitting that too and asked on you. Okay. Are you there, Galaxy Tab? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was just like a wave friendly hello. <laughs> oh, possibly. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll get us started. Um, yeah. What do you like to do outside of making music? Let's see. Well, me, I, um, I have a couple different interests that have come handy during the pandemic. So reading is a big one. Like I'm, uh -huh. I'm a pretty big reader, so I've been enjoying the chance to catch up with that. Um, and especially like, I mean, I, I read both fiction, nonfiction. I am mm -hmm. a big no fan of novels, but uh -huh. I've been reading a lot of Oliver Sacks books, you know, cause I, I'm kind of, I have like a very, very like amateurish interest in like, you know, neuroscience and, and all of those mm. kinds of things. And so I love reading about his, his work on the brain. And, and of course Ooh. he was such a music lover. So there's this, lots of nice connections there. So catching up a reading. And then my other sort of like long ago hobby from high school was running, which I started doing again in the pandemic. And I ran my first virtual race. So oh. I don't know if any of you have done some virtual 5Ks or 10Ks or what have you, but um, basically you just run, you do your normal run, but uh -huh. you know, you have this community around you and you use like an app such as like I was using Strava to keep track of my mileage and, and you know, you can submit your time that way and then you oh, get wow. the jersey and yeah, so I, you know, that was a new experience for me. So do, like, do they have like an avatar that can be you? <laughs> <laughs> like running along and yeah right you know they should huh that would be fun you can cheer them on yeah, yeah. that would be fun <laughs> well listen I, I see a lot of questions coming up um whose music do you like to listen to when you are listening or attending a concert hmm. that's a hard one to answer 
because there are so <laughs> Too many, many choices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's our problem as musicians. We you know, we we have access to everything, and then it's like you yeah. know, it's like. I always described it like when I go to a Vietnamese restaurant and there's like 200 things on the menu and it's right. like I just get menu yeah. anxiety. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I love to listen. I mean, besides, of course, American composers, I, I love I have a kind of a special affinity for French music. Mm. So I love, love, love Ravel, Debussy, mm -hmm. Faure, Franck, you know, all of, all of these composers. How about you, Louise? Um, I second that. Raphael is one of my favorite composers. Mm. Um, but I mean, I, I love listening to everything. It depends on my mood. It depends on who's playing what. Um, I, yeah, I just can't narrow it down. <laughs> <laughs> and what other instruments do you both play besides Louise being an amateur drum <laughs> drummer? <laughs> <laughs> she, I think she's I think she is more than amateur now that she's recorded. Really? On, what was it? A Tom Tom? What was the name of that? Um, well, for our concerts, I had been using a pair of rototoms because they were okay. Portable. Oh yeah. But for the recording itself, I actually brought in bigger drums. Nice. You yeah. brought in the bigger well, drums. <laughs> we, we've been, you know, we, we, we always have this, one of these days is going to happen that Louise has always wanted to take a violin lesson from me. And of course I'm mm. going to take a piano lesson from her. So th this is going to happen at some point. She has a violin. I do not have a keyboard. I'll have to have access to it. Uh -huh. I used to play piano very poorly. You know, there's a good reason why I, why I don't <laughs> play anymore. And I, I play some viola. I, I also double as a viola, violist and teacher, although violin is my, my primary instrument. Wonderful. But that's it. That's well, wonderful. I had a second instrument that I played in band, which was French horn. Oh, really? But yeah, I have that's, not played since high school. Yeah, that's that's something you kind of have to keep up. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't sound good unless you're playing it every day. <laughs> or even if you're playing it every day. Every day, right, exactly. <laughs> um, we are, it says, we are learning that not everything about the pandemic is horrible. What pandemic lesson skills might you keep once the pandemic has passed? Oh, I love that question. Oh. Um, well, we learned a lot of technology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you did your first, uh, well, you, you mentioned this before, but your first acapella, right? With yourself, like doing a duet with yourself. Oh yeah, <laughs> I did that. So that was a learning curve. I think <laughs> for, um, for me, it was, uh, I, I still have a lot to learn. So I'm a little, a little wary of saying this, but probably like cooking. I mean, mm. I didn't, I always like it, but I don't, you know, usually concerts are at mealtime. So I don't have a lot of time to spend in the kitchen, but at, during this pandemic, like I'll be teaching at home. And so something is on the stove or the oven or whatever. So that's something I hope I can retain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. I, I often pack dinners because I teach during dinner hours, but now I've been cooking dinner pretty often. So that's something new. That so I'm all of those learning. of you out there that think musicians are lazy because you see us getting up at like 11 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> it's really because we work through all our meals and we're up until two in the morning doing our stuff. <laughs> little little, little uh, shout out for musicians. <laughs> um, here it says, oh, oh, this is good. PDQ Bach asked, what is the difference between a violin and a viola? Answer, a viola burns longer. That's not a question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Well, looks, looks like you brought the right instrument today then. Um, are both of you able to teach in person or is it all online? I'm doing a little bit of teaching in person. I'm on faculty at Music Institute of Chicago, and they have allowed a limited number of students to come back, um, only using very large rooms, um, only certain instruments. So piano is OK, because they can have two pianos really far apart in the same room. Um, but the bulk of my teaching is still on Zoom right now. Yeah. Okay, so as you may have noticed from the video, we you know, the videos that we recorded of Smith and Walker were done at the school where Louise teaches. So you could see the red dividing line that demarks the six feet, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it was a large enough space that, you know, we felt socially distant and everything. For me, I'm, I'm doing all my teaching online because um, my two institutions are doing it that way. Um, I, I teach at the Northwestern University Music Academy and also at Lake Forest College. So, you know, we're hoping as soon as it's safe, we would love to return to in person, but for now, everything is online. Yeah. 
What, what, what do you find uh, are the greatest challenges to teaching online? Uh, just sound quality. Yeah. Having to and navigate you have that. Piano. Oh, sorry to interrupt. But you had a unique challenge because you have to show both oh, what you're doing the keyboard true. and also the piano lessons, this angle, right? The camera has to be, well, as this one sort of is, it's, but right now I'm not facing the keyboard. So if the student was playing like this, they cannot see me unless they have a second screen. So many of my students put like a phone or a tablet on the music stand in front of them. The ones who don't, and I need to get their attention, it's very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you playing, know, you know. yeah my, my, my wife has been teaching a lot in the house. And I think the words I hear more than any throughout the day are, no, no, lower, lower, no, no, I, no. <laughs> Lower. I can't see. I can <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think I said that earlier today. In fact. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, for, for violin, we're able to have this all here, so the, the ang camera angle is not as much of an issue. But yeah, just this, the sound quality, nothing compares to live, as I think yeah. you know, people were noticing. For me, um, so, I mean, it does have a little upside, which is that I can get I can show things up close. For example, I can show a student, you know, a fingering, like I can go like this, that I can't really do in person, so. Well, you could, you know, but it just might be weird. All bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> you know, brave, brave new world, for sure. It, it oh, and really... also, a lot of people are able to do, you know, um, from various locations. Like, I have students out of state. Of course, then that presents a time change. You have to be very specific this is central time you know we've had a few funny miscommunications oh. about that but it, taught, it does open up yeah i had a student this morning i taught she was in she's in russia right now oh wow yeah wow so awesome. finally we're teaching the russians how to play piano <laughs> <laughs> do, do you find that uh that you know, the, the kids are engaging with you or do you find some kind of a, you know, a, a sense of loss by not being in person? You know, I is there... think it depends on the student. I was surprised there were, especially younger students, some of them who were very scatterbrained in person were more focused on Zoom because they had to look at a screen and mm. it was this big. Um, and so, yeah. And then there were some other students who did very well in person, but they would wander away or they would get distracted very easily. Right. Um, but I think at this point, a lot of people have adapted. And so overall things have improved and becoming smoother. And yeah, I, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. I, I found too that perhaps it's a product of just, you know, all, all of us being home and not having as many activities well, I mean, everyone's very busy. I, I don't mean to say that. I know everyone's homeschooling and working from home and all these activities. But um, I think it has given my students a certain amount of focus that, you know, and they and it, I think enjoyment that this mm. is something they do, you know, for pleasure. And it's, it's something they can do away from a screen aside from the lesson, right? And yeah. interact, you know, people are getting creative with those apps like acapella, playing duets with people in other cities and- Yeah, that's been fun. Of fun. And even, yeah. there, you know, there are a lot of apps out there even now that you can play with accompaniment and some of the accompaniment will adjust to your tempo. It's, yep. You know, right. so it's, it's very adaptable. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I know. You're I out of a job, Louise. Louise. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> no, never. It's never the same. <laughs> well, I, want to, I have a question for, for people in the audience. What, what has your experience been going to concerts? You know, have, have there been... Um, you know, positives that you, you've, you've seen? Have you gone to more concerts just simply because, you know, you don't have to find parking? Or I'm, I'm just curious about that, you know? So, you know, if, if, you, if you want to yeah. throw something in the chat bar or you want to unmute, I'm, we're really happy to, you know, hear from you too. Or maybe this was your first one. Oh, I, I and, and as we're waiting for something to come in, um, I see, Somebody said, said, are you far enough apart to be able to take off masks for just a second so we can see you? Oh, maybe. I, I don't, do you want to see that? I didn't do my full, you know, because I knew. 
We only wear makeup. So Ready? Get up now. <laughs> so it's like a three, two, one. Ready? Three, two, one. Cheese. <laughs> Okay, going back on. <laughs> and and just so you know, I, Bill Bill is in the same room with me, and we are in masks, but but we are well <laughs> beyond six feet apart. He has the tape measure. <laughs> yeah, see, we are eighty inches. What is it? Oh, oh my God, we're just six feet eight. Oh, get back, Bill. Uh, <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, I'm curious to hear what other things people have been attending, what they've been enjoying, you know, or what they would <clears> like <throat> to see, what you all would like to see more of. Yeah, and please don't say a 60-person choir because we can't make that happen. <laughs> that's that's still beyond our, our, our capabilities given the current situation. <laughs> Well, listen, I, you know, if, if, if nobody has anything, oh, wait, are you, oh, no, uh, I have enjoyed this venue. I have not attended any concerts. Oh, wow. Yeah, so this is, if, if, if you have enjoyed this, know that there are more like these out there. You know, um, the Berlin Philharmonic, I know, has like archives of things that they're, you know, they're, and of course, that's a recorded format. Um, so there isn't the, you know, the interaction, but, um, let me see what else. We haven't been to many virtual concerts. We did do a virtual stage play. Oh, fun. Um, I love the Dree House. Oh, that's you. I was responding to someone who said that, that the Dree House has been on a pianist and soloist, Chanteuse. Oh, OK. Oh, I see. The, the Dree House Museum is put on with a pianist and soloist. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <clears throat> not brave enough, but warming up to virtual concerts. I hear you. Oh, good. Yeah, I, you know, as, 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 as a music, musicians, I mean, we're doing this stuff all the time now. And, you know, it is hard, you know, to, to attend these things sometimes. But I think I like this, this format, you know, and I've, I've attended a few different kinds, some with recorded elements and some live streamed where you really don't have any interaction with the performers. And then these, which is just a little more informal. And I think one of the great opportunities of this is, we don't do this quite in this way. Of course, you know, One Tree Many Branches live, we have the reception here and, you know, we'd all be able to, you know, hand you a dessert or something. But, but you know, we, there isn't usually this opportunity just really, you know, get in and, you know, upfront and personal with, with each other and to really kind of see what's happening behind the scenes. So we tried to take out, you know, you know, a lot of music so that we could have a little bit more space to connect as, uh, you know, verbally, too, in addition. So this has been way better than nothing, but it's just not the same. Well, way better than anything, which is I'm really sad to say that. But I'll come to more of these. I'm glad to hear that. Yay. Yay. Thank All right. You. Well, listen, folks, we, we don't want to take up your entire afternoons. And I'm, you know, like everybody, I'm sure you're zoomed out. It's a new term, zoomed out. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we'll certainly be in touch with you uh, as a follow up. Um, I believe Bill's going to be sending you an email uh, just kind of following up to say, see how, you know, how you thought of things and also to give you instructions uh, as to, you know, if you, if you would like to donate, how you can do that. But thank you all so much for being here today. It's, it's meant the world to us. We didn't know if, you know, everybody's going to get the message. We didn't know if everybody was going to feel in the mood. But we had a, a really nice sized crowd today, and that was exciting for our first impromptu series. So if you did enjoy this, please uh, do let others know. Uh, and, you know, we'll send you the links, and you can pass those on. It's the easiest marketing ever, right? Um, and we'll look forward to, to walking around Kevin Kosnick's basement. Uh, for our, our next installment of Impromptu. So thank you, Bill, for setting, setting this up. Uh, you did an amazing job. Thank you, Kate and Louise, for your wonderful performances today and for, you know, daring the live performance. It, 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 <laughs> it, it, it truly paid off. Um, oh, thank you. Our pleasure. And we will, we will see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.